Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Thursday, June 17th, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk heavyweight boxing. Let's talk the third fight between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, who at one point held the title for something like five years. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say, in terms of historical fights over the last, oh, three decades or so, in the heavyweight division, I believe the most historical fight, because I consider both of these fighters to be great, uh, didn't become apparent until after they fought. It's Lennox Lewis, then the heavyweight champ, against Vitaly Klitschko, who would become the heavyweight champ and keep the belt for years, right? I thought that was a historical fight between two very advanced heavyweights. Well, style-wise, another major heavyweight fight of the last 30 years, in my opinion, was longtime champion. Vladimir Klitschko, who we all have opinions, I didn't think was as advanced as Vitaly Klitschko. Right? Vladimir Klitschko against upstart, unbeaten at the time, Tyson Fury. Now, in that fight that Fury dominates, right? Talk about a guy taking a title by undressing the champion. Tyson Fury brings movement back to the heavyweight division, right? I keep telling people I was raised in the 70s. The 70s had some sluggers who didn't move that much, right? Ken Norton, uh, George Foreman. But understand, because of Ali, everyone started moving around him, right? So by the time you get to the 80s, you had Tony Tucker, who moved. You had Larry Holmes, who could actually move. Right? Every fighter seemed to have in their list of skills the ability to get up on their toes and to dance. That's what we called it. Dance. Everyone. Tony Tubbs. So then along comes a guy named Mike Tyson. Tyson makes the idea of operating from distance behind a jab on your back foot in the heavyweight division seem unmanly. So then we get to big heavyweights, right? Riddick Bowe, Lennox Lewis, and we forgot somehow that big men can move. What I want to encourage people to do is here online, look at the Larry Holmes, Ernie Shavers fight where Holmes gets dropped by Shavers. He gets off the canvas, he barely knows where he is. Shavers is about to beat Larry Holmes. And Larry Holmes then gets on his back foot. Gets on the balls of his feet. Starts flashing a jab. Holmes unbeaten at the time. Saves his unbeaten mark by clearing his head. While backing away from one of the most fearsome punchers I've come across, Ernie Shavers. Now, those skills left the heavyweight division. You had a few guys, Larry Donald could move, but most of the big names forgot about moving. The heavyweight division became a series of knockouts. Guys hunting you down. Then we get to Vladimir Klitschko, who's wooden. Right? Great jab. He would hit you with the jab. Then he'd come across with the right hand. One of the problems... And it was a problem. Is that Lennox Lewis's trainer, Emmanuel Stewart, and I'm a big Stewart fan. But understand, after Lewis leaves the game, he then moves over to train Vladimir Klitschko. And of course, even though Lewis had some guys, Thomas the Hitman Hearns, who could get up on the balls of their feet and dance. That's how Hearns is beating Ray Leonard in their first fight before Ray stops that fight, I believe in the 14th round, 12 round fight, Tommy probably wins that fight. Well understand, 
Emmanuel Stewart at heavyweight, specialized in sluggers, KO artists. So in my opinion, the heavyweight division gets stagnant from a style perspective, right? Gone were the days of back foot movement behind a jab, right? Gone were the days of guys showing up and they weren't there to necessarily hurt you. They were there to look good. So guys would be in the ring wearing tassels on their sneakers, right? Tassels on their trunks. The idea was you were going to notice the tassels moving because they were going to be moving. Right? This is in the era before Tyson comes in looking like Jack Dempsey with basic black trunks. Right? Don't get me wrong. When Tyson shows up, it is breathtaking. But you understood there was a break in the heavyweight division. Well, on the day when Tyson Fury takes the title from Vladimir Klitschko. Folks, it's a mismatch. Klitschko looks lethargic. Fury brings old school movement and feints behind a jab to Klitschko who can't read him at all. It gets so bad, at one point in the fight, Fury puts both hands behind his back and could not get hit. It's a paradigm shift, in my opinion, on par with another era when dancing was frowned upon at heavyweight and a long shot, Cassius Clay, took Sonny Liston's title. So understand, Fury was about to take us into a new era of movement at heavyweight, and he self-destructed. The mental part of the game is that demanding. These are guys who fight for a living. In every fight, something can go wrong. By the time the guy has entered the ring, he has sparred several rounds with sparring partners. It's a one-off. The better man could lose. The better man could get caught with a big punch and lose. Setbacks sometimes last for years. Look at the gap between when Ali loses the title, Joe Fraser, and when he gets that title back in Zaire. Right? Even great fighters can suffer multi-year setbacks in their careers if they lose. The stress is mind-blowing. Tyson Fury, for a bit there, lost his mind. Developed some very bad habits substance abuse, etc. Right? I'm not here to slow down the pitch. Let's call it what it is. So it's while he's out of the game that we get back to flat-footed heavyweights. Isn't that what happened? Right? Deontay Wilder's heavyweight champ, he's low volume. He's not high volume. He's flat-footed. He's not on the balls of his feet. Right? He's not moving around the ring. Quite frankly, the guy's not even stalking you early. Anthony Joshua, he's blessed with both hands. I believe Wilder is just blessed with a right hand. Joshua is blessed with both hands. But Joshua can't follow you around the ring early in a fight. He's not the Lennox Lewis who fought Andrew Galata. I want people to look up that fight. That's Lewis stalking a guy from the opening bell. I haven't come across the Anthony Joshua fight like that. These guys aren't there to batter you with a jab, then open up the uh, kitchen cabinet and take you out with combinations. No, this is a pot shotter era. Right? A combination for Deontay Wilder is a one-two. Right? Look at Dylan White. Dylan White's tethered to the pocket, folks. He's not moving around the ring. He's relatively flat-footed. Quite frankly, I'm still surprised Joseph Parker didn't beat him. As it was, as it was, Dylan White barely survived that fight. Look at the last round of Parker against Dylan White. Well, Tyson Fury's back. 
Understand, in my opinion, he wins the heavyweight title again in his third fight back. I shouldn't say wins it again, because he's the lineal to me the whole way through. I know there's some young guys out there who want to say, how could he be the lineal when he left the sport? My argument is, how could he not be the lineal? How could he not be the lineal when no one's beaten him? Folks, he's unbeaten as I make this video. Right, let me just say, years ago, we understood there were two groups in boxing. There was the group that felt that the heavyweight champion was clearly Muhammad Ali. Right, he's the champion. They then ban him because he won't go to Vietnam. Right, think about that. Ali's still unbeaten. Then they have some box-off involving Jimmy Ellis and Joe Fraser, right? Ali was a gold medalist in the 60 Olympics. Joe Fraser was a gold medalist in the 64 Olympics. Then, of course, they crowned Joe Fraser the champ. Now, I know there are many of you who are going to say, oh, Joe Fraser is the champ because Ali got banned. But then there's a group like me who's like, look, <laughs> you're the heavyweight champ. Right? Some Yahoo someplace can say, we're going to ban him because he won't go to war. Right? He won't fight in some military conflict. Or he's lost his mind. Right? But understand, folks like me are thinking in terms of, look, he hasn't been beaten in the ring. Right? Until one of these new guys beats him, he's the champ. Well, Tyson Fury had some mental health problems, left the sport. Now think about it. He's out of the sport for years. Comes back to the sport, and in his third fight back, the official story is that he got a draw with then-unbeaten Deontay Wilder. That's the official story, right? From where I sit, he dominated that fight. He lost two rounds in the fight, the two rounds where he got knocked down. He undressed Deontay Wilder. It wasn't a close fight. Right? If someone is to be blamed, it's Tyson Fury for a disastrous 12th round. Um, let me just say, it's even more shocking when he had a disastrous 12th round against Vladimir Klitschko. Understand, Klitschko's best round was a 12th round. You would have thought Fury would have thought to himself, you know what? After dominating Klitschko, I almost lost that fight in the 12th round. Let me be more careful this time. Here, of course, again, <laughs> when he's in for the heavyweight title and he's clearly won the fight, he's too close to Wilder in that 12th round. I'll agree. I'll agree with the bomb squad that the referee could have waved that off. Right? If you're a referee and the heavyweight champion is a knockout puncher, and the other guy is out cold on the canvas, then wakes up and is still slow in getting up at counts eight and nine. Some refs would wave that off. I know George Foreman someplace is thinking to himself, what a shame I didn't have Jack Reese as the referee for the rumble in the jungle against Ali, because Foreman, if you look at the film, gets up at the count of nine. No difference between Foreman getting up and Tyson Fury getting up. The referee in the Ali fight takes Foreman's title. The referee in the Tyson Fury fight lets the fight continue. Fury gets the draw, we get the rematch, and then you see what Fury looks like after adequate practice. This version of Tyson Fury is much better. Different level of fighter entirely than Deontay Wilder. Right? Much better. Tyson Fury, when he's prepared, when he's healthy, when his head's right, in my opinion, is a historical heavyweight. He's a reference point. Right? Just like you think of the 80s and you think Mike Tyson, right? It's like there are two heavyweights in the 80s who you remember. Larry Holmes, Mike Tyson. Right? That's the way Tyson Fury is. All of these heavyweights, 
who are tethered to the canvas, either on the outskirts of the pocket, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, or in the pocket, Dylan White. Folks, they're mismatches. They're fodder for Tyson Fury. I know this is not the way the public sees it. I know the Anthony Joshua crowd thinks I have something personal against Anthony Joshua. Look, I got nothing personal against Anthony Joshua because, quite frankly, I think Tyson Fury beats Deontay Wilder and Dylan White as well. Right? I mean, I know everyone thinks their fighter's special. I'm no different. I think the best, I think the top shelf in the heavyweight division is Tyson Fury. Let's go one step further. Look at how far back his fight was against Vladimir Klitschko. It's a shame Tyson Fury took a detour for health reasons because in my opinion, he's been the best for several years. He could have been on a Joe Lewis type brain. So let's get back to the Deontay Wilder fight. Let me just say this. There's some keys, you see them all in the rematch. Wilder only has one A plus punch. It's a straight right hand. Right? He can't set it up. So he's not a guy who's going to come in and hit you with some other shots and then slip it in. Right? He's not that guy. He's not Ray Leonard. He's not Marvin Hagler. Right? He's not, dare I say it, Andy Ruiz. No, this is a guy who needs to be outside. That left hand, that straight right hand needs to be the second punch he throws, right? He touches you with the left, then he comes across with the right hand. Or he waves the left, then he comes across with the right hand. That's his game. Now you'll notice in the rematch, Tyson Fury, who's big, he's taller than Wilder. Makes sure, as he's stalking Wilder, that he pays attention to the spacing. Now, the referee shouldn't have allowed this. You're not allowed in a boxing match to just go in there and stick a hand up without throwing a punch to measure a guy. But if you look at the film, that's what Fury does. Right? Fury makes sure that he's far enough away from Wilder, where if Wilder throws that right hand, it's not going to hurt Fury that much. That's the secret to the fight. It's the spacing. Now understand, and of course, Fury is coming across with hardcore straight right hands, right? Fury dispenses with the hooks. He's going to keep the fight at distance because he knows he's the better boxer than Deontay Wilder. If he takes away the threat of Wilder getting a KO, of Wilder landing a long right hand, if he keeps Wilder on the outside, he can dismantle Wilder. Then, of course, because Wilder has to defend himself from a guy who's stalking him, right? The problem with sluggers is they're accustomed to being the stalker. You turn the tables and you start stalking the slugger. And then you start to notice that Wilder's defense falls apart. Then you start to notice that Wilder's defense falls apart to the point where Fury can come in on Wilder's left side and reach his body. There's a knockdown in the second fight off a body shot. Right? At that point, you knew the fight was over. You heard me in this video, too, talk about the mental stress of being a fighter. Look, I know all of these guys. Try to look carefree, right? I know all of these guys act like they have no worries in the world, right? They're the best. No one can touch them, right? The reality is far different. Now, I've tracked some of Wilder's comments 
Folks, I'm wondering whether the stress has gotten to Deontay Wilder. Right? Wilder needs to have this fight because he's enforcing a contractual right. Right? We understand that. We also understand that he did take time off from the first loss of his professional career. He didn't exercise this right right away. There wasn't immediate talk of a Wilder Fury rematch. Well, just think about the statements he's made, and I know his new trainer, Malik Scott, is saying, hey, the stories of Wilder being down, being depressed, are bogus. Right, folks, are they bogus? I heard about Wilder's suit entering the ring. Folks, the fighter decides what he's going to wear entering the ring. That's not part of some grand conspiracy. Wilder could have said, hey, I'm not going to wear this 40-pound uniform into the ring. Wasn't that an excuse we heard? That he entered the ring and before punches were thrown, he had lost his legs. Right? Because the uniform was too big for him, too heavy. Could you imagine an old school guy like Joe Fraser making that excuse? Could you imagine an old school guy like George Foreman making that excuse? Well, it gets worse. Wilder, in a fight where he gets dropped, understand, I don't think Wilder's kids had him winning the Fury fight on their scorecards at the time of the stoppage. He's getting dominated, folks. He gets dropped. He's getting battered. He was upset that his corner threw in the towel. Folks, it's not like Mark Breland threw in the towel on a fight Wilder was winning. By the time the towel is thrown in, Wilder is bleeding out of an ear, has already hit the canvas, has his back up against the ropes, and is getting battered. Had the referee stopped the fight, no one would have been saying this is an absolute robbery. So then it got macabre, didn't it? Then we started hearing that somehow Mark Breland undermined him, that he threw in the towel prematurely. Then, of course, we started hearing that Wilder believes he was drugged. Now, which is it? Is it the uniform that he wore into the ring that deprived him of his legs? Did someone slip him a Mickey while he was fighting? Think about how ridiculous that is, right? If you're Mark Breland, aren't you in a great position training an unbeaten heavyweight champion? Why would you want to undercut it? So then, of course, we start to find out from Mark Breland that there were too many people in the room during Deontay Wilder training sessions that Wilder wasn't really focused on Breland's instruction. That this wasn't exactly Ali Angelo Dundee or Canelo Eddie Reynoso. This wasn't the fighter and some trainer he trusts. Right? Andre Ward, Virgil Hunter. This wasn't, this wasn't that type of relationship. This was a relationship where the trainer felt he had to compete to get Wilder's attention. And the problem, too, is you saw Wilder in the ring and you didn't get the feeling there was a multiplicity of game plans or skills. It wasn't like you watched a Wilder fight and you thought, oh, he's on his back foot here, right? He's trying to throw a left hook. Then you see another round and you're like, okay, he's on his front foot here. 
trying to throw the straight right hand. No, no, Wilder fights were always the same fight, weren't they? He's outside. He's hinting at throwing that straight right hand. Right, he's staying outside. He's not coming inside. Then, oh, here's the straight right. Oh, Brazil, Stavern, fill in the blank, is down. This fight is over. Isn't that the Wilder fight that you always saw? Right? When's the Wilder fight that you saw where you thought, oh, Wilder's really going to this guy's body? He's not a body puncher. He's not a hooker. So understand, Tyson Fury's from the other side of the street. Right? Tyson Fury is inside. Inside. Against fighters like Otto Wallet. Right? He's inside. Then he's outside. Against Vladimir Klitschko. In some fights, he's left-handed. And he's inside. And he's outside. You look at the Tyson Fury of the first Wilder fight. He's on his back foot. He's throwing a jab. He's trying to throw counters. You see him in the second fight against the same opponent. He's on his front foot. He's trying to throw straight right hands. He's not afraid to lead. He's keeping a distance, but yet he's backing up unbeaten Deontay Wilder. Right, so forgive me. I'm expecting a replay of the second fight. I'm expecting a third fight to be as close to the second fight as Sonny Liston's destruction of Floyd Patterson, the rematch, mirrored Sonny Liston's destruction of Floyd Patterson in their first fight. Right? What's Wilder going to do? He's Deontay Wilder. He's going to come out. He only has a puncher's chance. Only has a puncher's chance. Tyson Fury has to realize that he doesn't need a knockout to win the fight. He can outbox Deontay Wilder. He doesn't need the stoppage. He outboxed Vladimir Klitschko, a younger Klitschko, a champion. Klitschko. Where Klitschko had the championship. Unlike AJ, who beats an older Klitschko when Klitschko no longer has the belt. When Klitschko had been out of the ring for a year. Right, so if I'm Tyson Fury, I don't even have to worry. I don't even have to worry about Deontay Wilder's left hook. I just have to focus on a straight right hand. And understand, Wilder's not Manny Pacquiao. Pacquiao has a great straight left. The problem is, Pacquiao bounces around the ring. Pacquiao has great legs. And Pacquiao will come up on you, and Pacquiao will throw punches in bunches. So you could key on that straight left and still lose rounds to Manny Pacquiao. Right, you think you're in the middle of the ring, Manny Pacquiao has bounced around enough where you don't know where you are, suddenly you notice, like Oscar De La Hoya did later in their fight, that you're up on the ropes. And here's a guy with some of the fastest hands in the sport. That's not Deontay Wilder. Wilder doesn't like to throw combinations. Wilder's a pot shotter. Right, he is where the heavyweight division drifted during the Vladimir Klitschko era. So let's shake things up here. I know Fury has said, hey, Usyk's a blown up cruiserweight. AJ's gonna walk through it. You and I know, in fact, Fury himself knows from experience 
that life's more complicated than that. Couldn't Fury has, have easily called Steve Cunningham, right, USS Cunningham, a blown-up cruiserweight? Folks, Cunningham dropped Fury. That might be the toughest fight Tyson Fury has ever had. Understand, when Fury gets off the canvas against Cunningham, Cunningham, look at the film, is noticeably faster than Tyson Fury. Noticeably faster. Styles make fights. Sometimes slick cruiserweights can take out heavyweights. Are you sure that Usyk won't be able to do to Joshua what Cunningham did to Tyson Fury? Now Fury goes roughhouse. Fury goes on his front foot. Fury starts running into Steve Cunningham. Fury starts fighting dirty. Does Anthony Joshua have that in him? Well, understand, the fighters, in my opinion, who would give Fury a hard time would be Steve Cunningham. By the way, Steve's still in great shape, right? Why don't you guys think about an exhibition? That would be a great one where Steve Cunningham comes back, doesn't even have to be ranked, it's an exhibition, and we get a Logan Paul, Floyd Mayweather type of match, right? We know Steve's older, right? I think Steve Cunningham today would give Tyson Fury problems. I think Michael Hunter today would give Tyson Fury problems. I want people to revisit Michael Hunter against Alexander Povetkin. Right? I believe of the fighters out there, Dylan White, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, right? And again, I'm not biased against any of them. I think Fury beats all three. Right? No personal animus here against any of them. I just don't think they beat Tyson Fury. Out of all of those fighters, I believe Usyk is the one who has a chance to give Tyson Fury problems. I know it's counterintuitive, but it's the smaller, craftier guy with the better coordination who can pick his spots, who can neutralize Fury's clear foot speed advantage over the others. Right? Fury's clear coordination advantage over the others. Right? It's someone like Usyk who can match Fury in coordination, in foot speed. Who has some ambidexterity in them. Who could give them problems? Look at Michael Hunter's fight against Ustinov. That's another fight, and you'll see what happens when a coordinated, smaller guy is able to leverage that coordination against a bigger guy who can't find him. Fury should have lost his title already. Blood's gushing out of his eye when he fights Otto Wallen, who looks to be a better athlete than Fury. Right? The problem was that Fury, with his eye gushing, Right? The only thing that prevents the title from changing hands is the referee was willing to have that be a blood fest. Right? The ref easily could have looked at the eye just like the ref looked at Vitaly Klitschko's eye when he fought Lennox Lewis. And the ref could have said, that's it. I'm calling this fight. The ref did not. So Valen has himself to blame. Fury's able to then come inside on Valen and lean on him. What happens if Fury's eye starts bleeding and he tries to come inside on a hunter or an Usyk and they're not there to be grabbed? 
right think about it right so I think Tyson Fury beats Deontay Wilder unfortunately we might not have a fight between him and the winner of Joshua Usyk anytime soon because the winner of the first fight could well in my opinion be Usyk to those of you claiming Usyk doesn't have a punch please revisit Usyk stopping Tony Bellew who David Hay couldn't stop right that fight by the way takes place in Bellew's backyard Bellew starts that fight looking good doesn't he then gets deconstructed then you start to realize my goodness He's fighting a master. By the time that thought hit, Bellew was on the canvas, banged up, knocked out. Right? I think movement's back in the heavyweight division. I just don't think we, as fans, know it yet. I think Fury beats Wilder. I'm not concerned if Fury fights AJ. I'll be taking Fury. White, I'll be taking Fury, right? I'll have concern if Fury fights Usyk. And I need to have people understand the stakes involved because things creep up on you. Just like Teofimo Lopez, who I'm expecting to beat Cambrosis, hopefully COVID doesn't completely wipe out Lopez, right? If Lopez is still healthy, I think he beats Cambrosis. But just like the way things have worked out, Lopez has a chance to be undisputed at 135, then to pivot to fight Josh Taylor to be undisputed at 140. Think about it. If the sanctioning bodies allow it, if Usyk beats Joshua in the first fight, and let's say Joshua gets cut, decides to step aside for a fight because Fury already wants to fight Joshua, right? That's an easy payday, in my opinion, right? If I'm Joshua and I lose to Usyk and I know there's a rematch clause, I might say, hey, I'll tell you what, you can go ahead and fight Fury, but let me fight you after that fight. If I'm Usyk, since Joshua has a rematch clause, I would go for that deal. Right? But understand what might happen. If Usyk beats Joshua in the first fight, Joshua might then say, hey, look, I have a rematch clause. I want the rematch. And we might not get Fury against Joshua or Fury against Usyk for the next year and a half. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.